You're listening to the Sketchnote Army Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Rohde, the author of the Sketchnote Handbook and the Sketchnote Workbook. And this is the podcast where I chat with sketchnoters and visual thinkers and try to understand what makes them tick. Hey, are you looking for the ideal sketchbook for your sketchnoting practice? The Sketchnote Idea Book is the sketchbook designed for sketchnoters. Equipped with no bleed, no show through paper, you can take almost any marker or pen you can throw at it. Get 10% off with code ARMY at airship.store. Hey everyone, it's Mike and I'm here with Katrin Vitek. How are you doing, Katrin? I'm really good and I'm really honored to be on your podcast today, Mike. And it's so great to have you. I'm excited to hear your story and all the things you have to share with us. But first, I understand that you have a nickname, Cat, and I would love to hear <laughs> what's the origin story of this nickname. So actually, in 2014 and 2015, I went for a work and travel year in New Zealand. I'm originally mm. from Germany, um, and I decided I wanted to go to the place that's the furthest away from Germany. And that was uh, New Zealand. And it was also beautiful on top of that. Mm -hmm. And I worked at a little cafe restaurant thingy, um, and there was another employee from Germany and her name was Karina. So oh. Karina in English. And our boss, he switched up our names all the time. And then one day he said, you know, from this day on, I'll call you Karina and you're Kat. And from that oh. day on, with all my English speaking friends, I stuck with Kat basically. Kat. So yeah, that's how Kat came to be. Oh, that's great. You probably know how to make a really good flat white then, I suspect, if you worked in a cafe in New Zealand, eh? My barista skills came a little bit later. They didn't trust. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they didn't trust me with like the coffee machine. I was basically yeah. waiting tables and like getting sure. orders in and working on the till and everything. Uh, but a little bit later, I was finally taught how to do coffee. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. I'm glad to hear that. That's very important. If you go to New Zealand, you have to have a flat white, I think, yeah. or Australia. Yeah. So, well, or a mocha. Get... Uh, mocha. A mocha. Yeah. 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 Don't yeah. forget the mocha. Yeah. That's my wife's favorite drink. So she yeah, would be happy nice. to hear that. Nice. <laughs> So, hey, let's get started. I am really curious to hear your story. You've sort of hinted as we've gotten ready to begin that you have an interesting one. So tell us the story of how you ended up. Well, actually, let me back up. I think I'm I'm jumping my own schedule. So let's first understand who you are. So tell us who yeah. you are and what you do. And then we'll go. You can jump right into your origin story after that. Okay. So as a profession, I would say I'm a content marketer by day. I work in B2B content marketing um, part-time. And then I'm also self-employed. So I do freelancing work. And that's not only sketch notes and illustrating, but a whole range of copywriting and social media work. So I have a really diverse kind of career, I would say. Oh, that's great. And um, I, obviously, you're, the place that I found you and I've seen you do most of your work is LinkedIn, which is fascinating because... As social media goes, I've actually been more attracted to LinkedIn in a lot of ways uh, because the quality just seems like it's a little bit better. And there's, I guess, a little bit fewer ads. I don't know. They all seem overloaded with ads to me. But um, I know that Instagram has a strong uh, community around sketchnoting. But I'm starting to see, and I, you know, the thing I don't know is <laughs> on LinkedIn, is it because I'm following so many visual thinkers that my feed just seems loaded with visual thinking? Or is it actually a trend in LinkedIn? It's probably more likely the former in that I've sort of made a little bubble for myself. But I would love to hear, you know, a little bit of your thought on LinkedIn and the work you do there specifically. Yeah. So I think LinkedIn is a platform where visuals work really, really well. I think a part of that is that the platform is not like as visual as Instagram or Pinterest, for mm -hmm. example, because kind of like on Instagram, you had like this, this build up, like every visual had to be better than the other yeah. one. And people are just used to beautiful pictures and really good infographics and everything. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the content on LinkedIn is still text based. So I think once you add a really cool picture that's not a selfie like that actually drives value mm -hmm. um i think that's why they work really well and also because um linkedin is a bit more similar to facebook and the way that if somebody comments you this comment pops mm -hmm. up in your timeline if you follow the person so it's a lot more it's a lot easier to be discovered by other people mm -hmm. on linkedin um and especially like i when i was posting on linkedin i did a lot of career content mm -hmm. 
And that's perfect for the platform. You know, it's a whole like strategic networking and the career world. If you do content in that area, I think that's just pre predestined for LinkedIn. And I would say, yes, you live in kind of a bubble, but I think the amount of visuals and infographics and sketch notes is definitely increased over time. I think when mm. I started doing it, I didn't see a lot of work like that, but who was already on the platform at that time was Tanmai Vora. I think you know mm -hmm. him. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, I saw his sketch notes a lot um, and now it's gotten a lot more, which is cool. Oh, yeah. and you also see a lot of the, like the explain ideas visually on LinkedIn, like the really small graphics where it's just a simple yeah. idea. There are a few people who do that and they are all over LinkedIn. Mm, got yeah. it. And I happen to have, like my screen up has your one of your more recent uh, sketch notes, my takeaways from the LinkedIn algorithm report. So maybe I need yeah. to look at that sketch note and yeah. sort of understand what's going on and then yeah, do adjust that. accordingly, right? Yeah. Yeah, so. it will be a lot quicker than reading the whole like 50 or 60 page report. <laughs> Which is the beauty of sketch noting, right? So that's really great to hear. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we know what you do. Go into your origin story. It sounded like you had a really interesting history before yeah. to kind of bring you to where you are. I'd love to hear that story. Yeah. So the story is actually a little bit longer. So sit back. Yeah, go for just... it. We, we have time. <laughs> we have plenty of time. Um, so I actually, I, I started thinking about what you said, like, was there a moment in my childhood or in my school life? And I wouldn't say not really, but I always had really neat school notes because um, when I had like a messy note from school, I wouldn't learn it. Like I wouldn't learn from it. So I always needed to make sure like my handwriting was nice and like it didn't look messy. And I also remember like color coding different topics. You know, for example, we mm. did like the you know, the democratic system in Germany or whatever. And then it had like yellows, oranges and reds throughout like the whole topic. And then for another topic, I chose, I don't know, blues, purples and that all. So that helped me. And at that time, I had no understanding of graphic design or like how color mm. theory works. But I did that just intuitively. And I would say I was never really good at drawing in school, like arts mm. and drawing always came really hard. And it wasn't until I discovered the internet and that I could like retrace work of other people that kind of helped me understand like and get better at my art skills. Mm. Mm. And I also remember one funny story. It was actually um, during my A-levels, we had like in, in like the German language class, we were required to read all those classic, like all these classic books from Goethe and so on from the mm -hmm. 17 and 1800s. And I hadn't read a single one of them for my A-levels. <laughs> like du uh, during the years, like the grade 11 and 12, it was, mm. I think. Uh, I never read anything and then I got ki I kind of panicked. So what I did was I looked up the Wikipedia summaries um, and I couldn't I couldn't memorize any of it. So I drew a little comic. So I had like Goethe's mm. work in like a little scrappy <laughs> comic. And then all these other people's works. And I basically just looked at the comics the whole time when I was on the bus and when I was at home. So I never had read these books because I had so much other stuff to learn. Um, but that's actually, I think that's maybe when it started and when I found the power of visuals and with my really neat school notes that I had like in my, with that I had drawn. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of how it came to be. And I'm not sure if it was you who I found first, but I think actually it was Eva Lottalam. Makes sense. Who I, yeah. found, who I found first because she, it was in 2015, I would say, when I finished school, she did like a travel diary mm -hmm. consisting yep. out of sketch notes from her yeah. around the world trip. And I thought that was so cool, so incredibly cool. I was really inspired because I had also like traveled and I thought, I yeah. wish I had known it before then. And I think that's when I Googled the term sketch notes and then your book popped up. Okay. <laughs> the sketch note handbook. And I think at that time it wasn't available in German or maybe it was, but I ordered the English version on Amazon. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of read through it and I did some of the exercises and then I forgot all about it. Like mm. I, I got busy because I started a mm -hmm. degree, like after school, I started my degree in digital media and I was actually working in software development at the same time. And I was kind of doing like user research, user mm -hmm. experience design. I think kind of what you're doing mm -hmm. right now Correct. as well, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of forgot about the sketch notes. But what I always had to do at work was like facilitate workshops. So I worked a lot on flip charts and everything. And I always was really invested in making those flip charts look really, really nice and really mm. cool and really clean. Um, yeah, and I think that's kind of... 
during my whole degree, I kind of forgot about the whole sketch note thing. And when I finished my degree, I was kind of a little bit lost because I knew what I was doing before. I wasn't sure if I wanted to pursue that as a career. And I wanted to know maybe there's other stuff out there as well. Um, so I decided I want to take a break between my bachelor's and my master's. And I got a part-time job and I decided in 2019, I was going to do 12 creative projects. So each month was mm. one creative project. And that's when I remembered that I had your book at home. And I was mm. like, well, let, in January, let's start with the sketch notes because I really want to get better at them. And I've never kind of mm. got into them and never had finished any work. Um, so January was sketch notes. And I basically listened to podcasts about topics I was really interested in at that time. So that was personal finance. I was teaching myself a lot about finance and what to do and taxes and what not to do. And also health topics. Um, so from a research perspective, how do I live a healthy life? Like, what mm. do I need to do? What what should I eat? How much should I sleep? How do I reduce stress and everything? Well, um, mental health was was mm -hmm. really big at that time. So I listened to all those podcasts and I basically turned them into sketch notes to just memorize all the information that I heard on all the podcasts. And I started posting them on Instagram, like basically set up a whole new account, said, hey, here's my 12 creative project. If you scroll mm. down, you can still see the announcement. Mm. Um, and then basically just posted all of the sketch notes. Um, and it was really funny because one of the, oh, and what I wanted to say, one of my core values in life is lifelong learning. And I think the sketch mm. notes tie in really well with that because they help you so much with learning because you're visualizing the information and it helps you memorize it. It helps you retrieve it. Um, so that's why I picked it as a first project. And actually, I did one sketch note um, about uh, like mental health and nutrition. What are important nutrients for the brain? Mm -hmm. It was a podcast with a nutritional psychiatrist called Drew Ramsey. He was from New York. And I did a sketch note. I tagged him. Didn't expect anything of it, but mm -hmm. he saw the sketch note and he loved it. He was like, oh, this is so cool. And I, at that time, I had maybe done... I would say 10 sketch notes in total. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah, I know. And he was like, you know, I have this research about, I uh, in his research, he identified 23 nutrients that are important for the brain. And he was like, do you want to do a sketch note on each of them? And I was like, uh, okay, wait, I like, I, I'm I'm not a freelancer, you know, I've just only started this. This is a hobby. And actually, I have a February project coming up. So I was a bit confused, but I said yes, because I like to do things that terrify me. But mm -hmm. uh, you have to like at that time, my process was my process was still really, really basic. I was basically what you describe in your book, like I said, I don't know, the two way technique. So I mm -hmm. basically had a piece of paper. I drew everything on pencil, erased the whole lot and then like rearranged it and I had the whole pencil thingy. Then I retraced it with a pen. Then I erased my pencil lines. Then I scanned it. Then I put it in Photoshop and like made it look really neat. And that's what mm -hmm. I uploaded. And that's also what I did for Drew Ramsey. So it was really mm. tedious. Mm. And it took a lot of time to do the like 23 nutrients. <laughs> I bet. Um, yeah. And I can tell you, I never got around to doing the another 11 projects of that year because uh, Drew was really happy. And then he came to me and he said, you know what? I'm writing a new book. Do you want to illustrate it? And I was like, wow. oh my God. That's great. <laughs> Yeah. Scary, but great, right? It was really scary. I think it was there was a lot of serendipity involved in that whole mm -hmm. story because I basically had just started. It was just to figure out what I wanted to do with my creative life and with my <laughs> career. And it was just one project of many projects. Like I had so much cool stuff coming up. I wanted to do product design and videos and editing, but I got stuck with the sketch notes. Mm. Um, and the book was really cool. The topic was Eat to Beat Depression and Anxiety. So basically the nutrients that are important for the mm. brain and like if you suffer from certain mental health conditions. And Drew was super cool. He was writing the script at the same time and he always mm. sent me the script and he basically said you have full creative freedom. Wow. You can decide what to make a sketch note out of. Here's the script. You can decide how many sketch notes you want to make. Um, and I can remember I got, because he um, published a book with Harper Collins, and they sent me this whole illustrative agreement. I was like, oh, my God, I have no yeah. idea what I'm signing here and what they want from me. <laughs> and file types, they were re really, I, I had no idea what they wanted. Production, and I was, yeah. Yeah, I was so terrified. 
Um, but I did it. And for that project, actually, I knew that my whole pen and paper and pencil and scanning and photoshopping wouldn't work. So I got the iPad for that. Mm, so basically okay. took all the money that I made from the 23 nutrient schedules and put it in an iPad so I could do the book project. And that was super fulfilling. And they never had any revision wishes or something like that they mm. basically were like oh you wanted to sketch out on the benefits of dark chocolate do it you know like just mm. just do it and it was so cool um and that's i would say yeah that, that took around um, half a year mm -hmm. um so basically my, my break had come to an end and i was really doing a lot of sketch noting like well in retro prospect it it wasn't so much sketch noting work, but I also had a part time job. So for me, it was kind of mm. full, like it filled a lot of my time, um, and I didn't have time or the creative energy to do anything else um, mm -hmm. at the time. By the way, um, and fun fact: these old sketch notes that I created with the pen and paper and photoshopping and scanning and everything, they also landed in the book. Lo nobody told me. Like they totally <laughs> didn't fulfill the technical requirements and stuff, but Drew was just like, I want this in the book. He's passionate I want... about it. Huh. Yeah, he was passionate and he didn't care that they had a totally different style and like the quality was really different to the iPad because of how the way I worked back right. then. Right. Um, and it was so funny that he like just put them in the book as well. Yeah, that, that was really funny. Mm. Um, and after the book project, I started my master's degree. I was kind of figuring out I wanted to go into marketing um, and like my degree was in corporate communications. And it was really funny. We had a social media module, like basically do a social media strategy. Uh, my professor, he had these companies that we could collaborate with, or we could also bring our own project. For example, like one of my classmates, he brought, I think his um, dad's tax office firm or something mm. like that. And then I, um, during my degree, I got really interested in LinkedIn because I was first, like first time in my life, I actually knew or kind of got to know what B2B and B2B marketing was. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of found out, okay, there's this platform LinkedIn and everybody's on LinkedIn. I should maybe make an account too. And at that time, I think personal branding, like the whole term and the concept of it was really popular on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Right mm -hmm. now it's everywhere, but at that time it kind of grew in it's popularity, pretty, pretty I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And then I thought, hmm, maybe I can do my own personal branding strategy. And then I asked my professor and he was like, yeah, sure, do whatever you want. And I was That's like, so cool. smart. <laughs> cool, let's do it. Um, and then uh, I, I think I got a book about digital personal branding. It was a German book. Mm -hmm. And uh, the author, she basically said, you know, because you have to figure out your content strategy and what you're going to write about and what mediums you're going to use and what you're the purpose is and who who your audience is and she basically started like lay out your superpower portfolio so basically write down all your skills your knowledge your unique experiences and then i did like the whole exercise and i put sketch noting in there like for my skills and then she said well which ones do resonate the most like circle them and then make your content strategy out of it mm -hmm. and then i kind of knew okay sketch notes were going to play a big role in my personal branding thingy kind of um, and at that time, because I was on LinkedIn, I was really interested in like, how could I advance my career? I had basically just done a pivot, you know, from like UX design to marketing. Mm -hmm. And then everybody, like there were so many content creators talking about um, how to negotiate your salary, what to put on your CV, how to strategically network on LinkedIn. I thought it was so cool. Like I never heard any of that before. And everything I learned from LinkedIn lives and podcasts and other people's posts, I just put into sketch notes because I wanted mm. to memorize it. And that was really cool because, like I said, the whole career content really resonates with the whole LinkedIn audience because yeah, everybody's, sure. everybody's kind of trying to advance in their careers mm -hmm. and in their jobs. Um, so, yeah, that was really cool. I think basically... I had a few favorite creators and they had a huge following. So what I did, like I, I watched a talk and then I created a sketch on, then I tagged them. And like I said earlier, LinkedIn works a bit like Facebook. So then they saw mm -hmm. it, they commented and then their whole network came Would to follow. my sketch notes. Yeah. And that's kind of how I created this, in, in my eyes, huge following, like 10,000 mm -hmm. followers is not huge, but for me, it's like, <laughs> oh my God, that's it's crazy. Pretty good. It's pretty, yeah. pretty huge. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I grew. And the sketch notes, they really blew up. I would say, like, 
after the social media module, we had to do a presentation with our analytics. And I think I had like half a million views on my content, wow. which to me was just mind blowing, you know? <laughs> it, yeah, I had no idea how to explain. It was just like, you know, I did this, I, I posted this, this was my strategy and it just worked so well. It was incredible. Um. So yeah, that was, and like I said, visuals work really well on LinkedIn. That definitely contributed to it, even though I had a super small reach. Um, but yeah, since all the big creators saw it and brought their audience, that didn't kind of matter so much. And then funny story, then it was summer and I was a bit exhausted from the module. And I thought, whoa, that was intense because like all these people text you and write you and like, how do you do it? And do you want to hop on a call? And I was like, ooh, really overwhelmed with all the attention that I got. Mm -hmm. And then I went abroad, funny, funny story. And then I went abroad uh, to study in Scotland for a semester. Mm. And I had another digital marketing module. And our professor was basically, um, you just have to create a website and market it. And you can create a website about whatever you want. And I'm like, well, I'm going to pick my own website and market yeah. it. So that's how my website came to be out of that university project. And with mm. the marketing, I basically continue what I was doing anyway on LinkedIn. Then I posted a bit more on Instagram and on, I tried out Pinterest as well. But I basically just continued for the module, what I was doing um, in the old module as well. Um so yeah, I'm really grateful that my university professors, both in Germany and in Scotland, they just let me do my own thing and work on my personal brand because it it paid off crazy. Like mm. I, I still can't believe like the few sketch notes that I posted, I got so much attention and my audience grew. And yeah, I'm really thankful they just let me do my own thing and get university credits for it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so that, that's and cool. You really got good value from from your education in that sense because it was yeah. so directed and practical. So the yeah, as I listen to your story, the two things I reflect on is you actually started this all with you mentioned uh, you know reading about Guta and and all these masters right, and you made these little comic books that you then studied. Like yeah. you realized really early that there was something about the visualization at least for your brain at that point, you probably didn't think about anybody else, right? You just wanted to yeah. pass your A levels. Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> you were, you were using this technique to visualize this information and you found that it worked for you and yeah. that you came back to it. Right. And that turned out to be sort of the seed for everything that you're doing, which is cool. <clears throat> and then the second part is um, what you just said that your professors were open to you sort of directing your own path of the things that you wanted to market. And I think I would, I would imagine from a professor's perspective. And when I was in school, I relate to this, that <clears throat> there was a crew of a couple of people who were sort of really interested in doing more than the, more than the curriculum said, right? There were a lot of people that just did exactly what the curriculum said and they met it to the T. They did exactly what the teacher wanted, but it was kind of boring, right? Like it was the same as the sample. Like it didn't really, extend further. So I can imagine these professors more have the problem of students, like if they gave them any choice that they would not choose anything, they would just sort of go to the the ones that everything everybody else does, right? And so they might have actually been excited to see that you took it in a direction that most students don't, which is, well, I know me the best, let's market myself and take that as the, the case study. So that's kind of cool that the opportunity was there and that you you sort of kept on leaning on it. And then I guess the third thing would be your sense um, with these sketch notes that you did initially that turned into, you know, 23 sketch notes and then a book mm -hmm. that it's, it sort of reveals to me that if you're in the right place at the right time doing this work and you hit, hit the right person, those opportunities can open up like, and obviously they did. And then you were, um, aware enough that you stepped into those, even though they were probably pretty scary, right? Doing 23 sketch notes manually and doing all this, you know, this work and then jumping right into doing a book illustration project was a real, I'm sure a real challenge and maybe freaked you out a little bit at the time, but now you're glad that you did it, right? Think of, you know, how, how much that's impacted your career and, and your person as well. So that's just a great, Great story. It's really fun to listen to you to share it with us. Yeah, I, I would definitely say because what you so I think and 
there's a whole lot of serendipity involved. Like, mm -hmm. like you said, I was at the right time in the right place. Um, and what I also didn't expect, you know, basically my goal with the whole like personal branding thing on LinkedIn, which people know me for now, they, they don't know me for the, the book illustration project or what I did back then, the little bit of work. Um, but it's impacted my career in like so many ways that don't directly translate to sketch notes even. Um, for example, like I had recruiters reach out to me. I was, I was a, like, I was a marketer on LinkedIn, but I kind of must have thought, that my sketch noting skills kind of translate to well she must be a good marketer you know she gets all this engagement she kind of has to know what she's doing on social media and um, so that was really astounding that basically mm. they just just saw the sketch noting skill but they assumed I was a good marketer because of what I was doing um then also I remember I attended like an online google career event for women and I basically they had like a lot of lots of inspiring speakers and I basically just put the the, my favorite quotes on like a really nice looking sketch note mm -hmm. and then you could apply for this google career upskilling program as a university person um and i just like you know i, I networked with all the people that i put on the sketch note like the quotes i put the quotes in the sketch note and then i also submitted this with my application and i got into the program <laughs> and i think that the, the it was a really smart way of like saying hey i'm i'm going the extra mile and i really right. want this uh, but that was really cool. And then also one of my former employers, they had seen me on LinkedIn and I was doing like paid media work for them. But they were like, oh, do you want to kickstart our LinkedIn strategy? You know, do you want to mm. come up with that? And I was still a student at that time. So that was kind of big, you know, like coming mm -hmm. up with the strategy and presenting it to the whole, like to the founders and the CEO of the company. That was really cool. Um, and I think also it always gave me in the hiring processes as a marketer, it always gave me a big bonus because I'm a content mm -hmm. marketer and I want to make sure I kind of have a really diverse skill set be it writing or basic ed video editing skills or basic graphic design skills and then I also have like the sketch noting skills in case mm -hmm. they need it at some point and then I have of course the freelance work as a sketch noter but also like freelance work as a copywriter for LinkedIn because mm -hmm. they see hey I know how the platform works and then people approach me if I can help them with their LinkedIn profiles and with their content and because mm -hmm. I'm a polymath like I'm a multi-passionate yeah. person I have many interests yeah. I have many interests in life I really appreciate it you know that not only sketch noting work came from this but so many other opportunities that's yeah. so cool that's for me that's the best part about the whole story that's really great. And I think, you know, not to be missed if you're listening is Katrine was um, very aware of these opportunities. Like I, I remember there was a study years ago, they talked about happy people or something or lucky, lucky people. I don't know if you've heard this, this uh, story that they had a newspaper and like um, the lucky people would notice that there was an ad like in the second page that said, if you see this ad, stop reading and go, go collect your money, you've won or something, right? Uh, but people that were unlucky who thought themselves unlucky would miss that. And they were looking through this, this newspaper. So apparently that was the whole test. And it, the, mm -hmm. the study more deeply talked about like being lucky is much more of a mindset because these things happen to many people, but many people are not prepared or not aware or not willing to do what you did. Right. So you were aware you were prepared with, you know, to do something, but then you also took a risk, right? Like, Doing those 23 things is probably scary. Some people might have turned that down. And that whole line of books and everything that happened would go up in a puff of smoke, smoke, yeah. right? So this idea that you're open to trying new things and, you know, the possibility of failure is there, right? That could have gone yeah. badly and, you know, but you wouldn't know that until you went down that path. So I think, you know, if you're listening to this and thinking, oh, she's so lucky. It's like, well, she kind of made her own luck. She was, she saw these opportunities and she took a risk that could have gone the other way. And it yeah. just worked out that she did the hard work to deliver. Right. So I think that this is such a great, such a great origin story. That's so inspiring. Maybe we don't need tips. Maybe you just need to listen to the origin story again, instead of the tips. I don't know, but <laughs> I have, um, I, I have one fun mantra that ties in really well with this. Uh -huh. I always say to myself, I can be terrified and brave at the same time mm. you know same with the podcast I was super scared to come on and like talk about this and it's my first podcast yeah. but 
it, it this doesn't keep me from doing stuff. Same with the book project. I don't understand the illustrative agreement and everything, but I, I'm gonna figure it out. You know, I'm terrified, yeah. but that doesn't mean it keeps me from doing the thing. And yeah, that's one of my life thingies that's really important to me. I love that. That's a great. That's a great one. So okay. So we've got your origin story. Tell us about what's a project that you're working on now that you're really excited about, either something that maybe just came out or maybe something that's in the works that will come out when this episode releases in March sometime. Yeah. So what I was really excited about was part two of the LinkedIn algorithm report mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. by Richard van der Blom. And it's actually quite funny, you know, I've landed so many dream projects in my life, basically by giving away a little bit of my work for free. Yeah. Then the person seeing it and then them hiring me to do more of that. And that same thing happened with Richard. So basically did the LinkedIn algorithm report in 2021. Based just for free, I found it and I thought, oh, this mm -hmm. is a great piece of content, maybe a bit too long for LinkedIn. Let's put it in a mm -hmm. sketch note. I think this could be really beneficial. And um, Richard basically said how well, like how it blew up. And he was like, wow, that's crazy. Like, can you do more of that for me? And I love working with him because I always say it's more important who you work with than what you yes. work on because he basically gives me full creative freedom. Like yeah. he's not somebody to do many revisions. He's basically, or oh, just do whatever you want. I trust you. You're the expert. Um, and apart from that, actually, that answer might surprise you, but I've taken a step back from freelancing in particular because I was mm -hmm. doing so much freelance work and not much work just close to my heart, you know, just yeah. for myself as a hobby. Um, and freelancing burned me out a little bit, particularly the kind of being stuck in revision hell, like mm -hmm. revisions going back and forth and back mm -hmm. and forth and back and forth. Um, so I'm kind of like taking a step back and really asking myself the question, is this something I want to make a lot of money with or is it more a hobby? And if a dream project comes along my way, then I'm going to do it. But otherwise, I'm going to say no. I don't have an answer to that question yet. And I think mm -hmm. like some days I lean more towards that and other days I lean more towards like the hobby side of it. Yeah. Um, but what I know and I think... I always listen to like the other guests on your podcast and because they are all like they have made a career out of it and they are like illustrators and everything. But me as a multi-passionate person, I don't want to be like a full-time illustrator or a full-time sketchnote artist. Mm -hmm. I want to have like what I do as a content marketer, I can do so many different disciplines right. and sketchnoting is one of them. So um, yeah, kind of like freelancing has taken the joy away from it a little bit. So I'm taking mm. a break right now to kind of find my passion again and the things I'm really passionate about and um, then maybe get into freelancing again. Like if one of my favorite podcasts said, hey, can you be like our sketchnoter for every yeah. episode? Like Andrew Huberman, I love his podcast, Neuroscience. And then I, as a, he talks about neuroscience, then I would be, of course, I would uh, draw each of your episodes. But with other projects, I'm like, really, I have to be really excited either about the person mm. that I work with or about the work they do. Otherwise, it's a clear no. It needs to be a hell yes for like the work that I do. Yeah, which yeah. is uh, Derek Sivers, of course. Yeah. Um, hell yes or no is his uh, yeah. famous book. And uh, yeah. so it seems like, you know, what you're talking about is kind of opportunity cost, right? Like if I do yeah. this, if I'm doing freelance work, what if this amazing podcast comes in and I'm loaded, right? I can't do it right? The opportunity yeah. might be lost there. So you have to be careful. I think in some ways, probably the advantage you have in working part-time is that you sort of have to make a choice, Yeah. <clears throat> right? If you're doing that something like this full-time, then, you know, you could, you'd have more margin to do more and maybe yeah. you wouldn't feel it, but being part-time helps you get clarity around what you want to do. And then the, probably the other thing I would say is uh, you probably would identify that uh, as a multi-talented content marketer that Sometimes sketch notes aren't the right medium for something, right? Sometimes yeah. video is a better medium or writing is a better medium, right? Like it's like a, it's like a, uh, an expert um, mechanic, right? They don't use a, the wrench for everything, right? Because, you know, it's not designed for that. You use a tool that's designed for that task yeah. in the same way. Sketch noting can be overused, I think, right? If And become, you know, just, uh, if you see too much of it, then it becomes, you um, you know, like back background noise or something. So deploying it in the right opportunities probably is important there. So yep. I, I actually, you... go ahead. I, 
I actually wanted to ask you, Mike, how you kind of decide which freelance projects to take mm. on and how you prevent like creative burnout, because I definitely struggled with it. So I wanted to hear yeah. your opinion well, on this. I've struggled with it as well. Um, so I do a full-time job as a user experience designer. I love doing it. I work in software. Uh, for some people, they would look at what I do and think that's like the most boring thing ever, but I love it. Like helping work on like, um, you know, corporate software and solving, making somebody's life. I don't know who these somebody's are. Somebody's life is going to get better because I've spent the time to think about what's the right way to work through this workflow so that it's smoother, that it's cleaner, that if I do it in one area, I it applies to another area, all these kind of things that I think about. So that's my full-time work. And what that means is that all the sketchnoting stuff that I do, if I travel and I teach at a school or if I go to the international sketchnote camp or whatever I do, like I've got a limited time to choose from. So I have to be very choosy and picky. And I think I followed a similar pattern to you. It's, you know, it's either really yes or no. And I think, um, you know, I tend to be uh, someone who loves to help people. So I'll tend to say yes a little bit too much. And I've been getting better at saying no. And I think one of my solutions has been to build a network of people who do work that I admire so that when I get the project that comes in, it's like, eh, I could do that, but I'm not in love with it. I could think, you know, um, John is really good at that. Let's, I'm going to make a connection to John or Mary, just as an example. So then I, you know, for me, I need this outlet of like somebody else who I can trust that will handle it. That is a good fit. Like they would fit together. And then I just redirect that inquiry to that person um, and then try to focus on the things like I'm excited about it or I think it will have an impact. And that's hard. Like, I, I, just, I don't think I've solved the problem completely because I certainly occasionally will get projects that aren't exactly what I want to do. But for the most part, I think um, your comment about finding the right customers is really important. So the people you work with are much more important than the projects in a lot of ways, because if you're given creative freedom, like you've said, and I think the other thing, the other thing I would say is finding clients that are collaborative. It sounds like many of the clients you've mentioned were very collaborative in working with you. So they were open to your expertise and would listen to you uh, being able to modify what they were thinking. Like they come to you with an idea and then you come back with them with an alternate idea, like you just twist it a little bit and say, did you ever think about maybe doing this or that? And then they're open to it. That's a really important aspect for a customer that I sort of look for. And you sort of, you can tell pretty quickly when you start working on something with someone, whether that's there or that's not there. And then you would have a tendency, like I have a few people that I work with, like if they call and say they need something, I'm an immediate yes. I don't even have to think about it because I like that person so much. So, and I, it sounds like you have similar people. So those are the few things that I do. I think the last thing I'll say is um, having kids for me is helpful because I can't work all the time. I need to spend time with my kids. I like cooking with my kids. I like spending time with my wife and I have an, a whole other life beyond all this stuff that I try to keep. that keeps me grounded um, and just reminding myself that I can't do it all. And it's okay. Like there's many other people and it's a huge opportunity. Everybody's got plenty of work to do. And I'm, it's, if I give it away to somebody else, it's not like the work will stop coming. It just keeps coming. So yeah, I don't know if that's helpful. Absolutely. And I totally, I'm totally on your side and I share your uh, view here. I was wondering, Mike, was there ever a time when you consider considered like sketchnoting your full-time career? Because you're kind of like the inventor of sketchnotes. So I'm yeah. surprised actually mm -hmm. to hear that you have this whole full-time job yeah. apart from that. You know, I've considered it in the past. Um, it just felt like with a family and all the, all the responsibilities that yeah. um, the variability would be a challenge. Uh, I think maybe sometime in the future that would make sense. But I think honestly, like having it as a side gig has been good. And I've sort of hinted to in the, in the feedback I've given, which is because it can only be a side gig, it forces me because I'm such a uh, helper and wanting to help people. It forces me to choose. Like if I had it full time, I might like really overload myself. Right. And so having this finite constraint is actually a good thing for me. I found that with sketch notes too. Right. I stumbled into sketch notes because I constrained myself to a little book and a pen. And that helped me to move into the space where visualization made sense, right? Because I couldn't write everything down. I couldn't draw everything. I had to do it in the moment. Like this, the whole 
that whole history was tied to constraints. And I found any time where I put some limitations on myself is when I'm most creative. And I think that's maybe true for other creative people too. So having that limitation on what's available forces me to make a decision like, am I really going to spend the next three months working on this thing or, or is it better spent on something else? And sometimes I don't make, you know, sometimes I choose and it's like, oh, I wish I hadn't done this Hmm. or it's taking longer than I wanted. I'm still happy with the output, but it means again, the opportunity cost means because I'm working on that, I can't take something else that comes in. So I have to be more careful. So I think in some ways it's, in in some ways it's better to have it as a side thing because I can really be selective. Yeah, I absolutely love it as a side thing. Like I said, especially as being a multi-passionate person, it helps me so much. And then also realizing my time is really valuable. Mm -hmm. Like, because otherwise I would have maybe the whole week and now I have a few hours every week and then kind of like communicating this to clients and also saying, hey, you know, like don't expect revisions in the next, I don't know, in the next five days because I'm really busy with other things. And it helps me prioritize and also keeps my life super interesting, you know, because I have this other thing next to my Mm -hmm. regular job, like my employment. Um, And yeah, I love it. I wouldn't have it any other way. So I can totally Mm -hmm. get what you're saying. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, maybe in the future, uh, the opportunity comes where it becomes a full-time thing. (laughs) I think the other thing that I didn't mention is, when I started all this stuff, there really wasn't a sketch noting anything, right? It was, there were people kind of doing it. Eva Lotta was doing it around the same time. Mm-hmm. And we started to build this community, right? So a lot of the work has been building a community of people that do it so that I have students to teach now. So now I'm doing more teaching and that's working well because there's actually people that are interested enough that they would spend money to get real deep teaching. Um, and then also companies being aware, like I think you're starting to see this, companies are becoming aware that visuals in the right context can be incredibly powerful. And so there's actually enough of a supportive market that you could be full-time. Actually, you know, many of the people on the podcast, like Ben Felis and a bunch of other people are full-time because of both of those things. There's a community that's willing to hire them to to learn. And then there's professionals that are willing to pay for them to do the work. So I think a little bit of it is timing and waiting for the, for the market to be there. Um, so that that sounds like something maybe in the future would make sense to move in that direction. Yeah, but I haven't absolutely. decided that yet. So it's so fun what you said about teaching because I'm I'm not at all into teaching sketchnoting to other people. So many people mm-hmm. have asked me like, how do you do it and what do you use and how did you get started? And I always just point them to your book. I'm like, <laughs> sketchnote handbook. Well, by Mike is the only thing you ever need to read and practice like to do to learn <laughs> sketchnoting. And then I'm always so happy when I see you have like another live workshop coming up and I'm like, yeah, go, go to Mike, he'll teach you. Yeah. Um, Cause I learned from him and that's like, he, he does such a great job. So um, every oh, time I hear somebody who wants to learn sketchnoting, I point them in your direction. Well, now if you're a German speaker and you're listening, there's another opportunity with um, Eva Lada's got a course that she's offering Ooh. on Udemy, which I think, I think it's around 20 euro, something like that, $20. Um, and, you know, anything that Eva Lada does is excellent. She's, I'm one of her biggest fans. She's really great and she's very skilled. So that's in, in German language. So if there's Germans listening, could be a really good fit if that's more natural for you um, to check that out. So look that up. And she also does more intensive teaching on sketching. So she's a great teacher as well. Not I can a, only a, second that. I love her work. Yeah, yeah she's really great. This episode of the Sketchnote Army podcast is brought to you by Concepts, a perfect tool for sketchnoting, available on iOS, Windows, and Android. Concepts Infinite Canvas lets you sketchnote in a defined area while still enjoying infinite space around it to write a quick note, scribble an idea, or keep pre-drawn visual elements handy for when you need the most. The Infinite Canvas lets you stretch out and work without worrying if you'll run out of space. And when combined with powerful vector drawing that offers high resolution output and complete brush and stroke control, you have a tool that's perfect for sketchnoting. Search Concepts in your favorite app store to give it a try. So, well, let's shift to, so we've talked about your whole origin story, what you're working on now. Let's shift into tools. I'm really curious. You sort of hinted at this, right? You originally were doing this 
pencil sketches and inking and erasing and Photoshop. And like, that's the way I did it too. Right. Cause that's all there was, right. Yeah. You had to, you had to do that. Um, now we have really great uh, mobile phone cameras. There's even tools on mobile phones to do modifications. We have platforms like LinkedIn and Instagram where we can share these things. Tell us about what's your, what are your tools that you use now? And let's start, if you still use any analog tools, what are those tools? And then uh, digital after that. So uh, with the analog tools, I thought about it a long time. I actually, mm. over the years, I became kind of a minimalist um, and kind of like decluttered my whole home and everything. And I have to say, sketchnoting and illustration doesn't go well with that because like <laughs> you just you have to buy a pen in every new color that's out there. And then it just never stops, you know, with stationery and pens and notebooks and everything. So I kind of like they didn't make the cut after I switched to the iPad. But I always like if I do some work, I always uh, use the Stettler, Stettler mm. pigment liners. Yes. I think they're favorite in the community. Excellent. And, yeah. and I basically just like what I had at home, I used Stabilo pens back then. I had Copic markers, but you need uh, a certain kind of paper for them because they're right. alcohol based. Yeah. Otherwise, they bleed through everything. Right. Um, Copic markers, I had a f few Tombow brush pens that I used, mm -hmm. but it was really basic. Like I basically had like maybe. 20 pens and pencils that I used the whole mm. time and then I made the switch to completely digital work because I was always like where, where do I store all of my work it's not only stationary right. and pens and pens like where, where do I keep it like there and then there's the elements there's heat and light and everything like works against your work you know you have to kind mm. of preserve it and I was getting really stressed out about that so I'm now I'm kind of more chill you know that i know it's all in a digital space and now my digital space is really cluttered but i'm i'm working on that as well um but yeah since then i've basically switched to the ipad and procreate you know the standard mm. stuff and mm. it's really cool um, and what i want to get i haven't tried it because i don't actually know anybody who's doing like ipad kind of work um mm. but i never got one of the like paper like skills oh, yeah. cuz i, yeah, I yeah. never wanted to put them on my ipad permanently but now i know there's a company they do a magnetic thingy yeah, i've seen this yeah as well on instagram i think i've seen this yeah yeah and you can basically just put it on and then cuz i watch a lot of tv series and stuff on my ipad then i don't want mm -hmm. the paper like thing on it and then i can just put it off and then when i draw i can put it back on and what was really game changing for me because i hated doing sketch notes in the summer because my mm -hmm. hand always stuck to the ipad yeah. you know um and then i discovered like the drawing gloves like that mm -hmm. just go around your fingers down here yeah. and yeah. they've been a game changer they are so cool so um mm -hmm. that's kind of like it's an analog tool that i use for digital work <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. We have a few friends. Rob Tavio was a huge fan. Michael Clayton, another friend, used those gloves. I think I have one yeah. in my bag somewhere. I haven't used it for years. I think a lot of it, those were, um, at least for the iPad, were because the uh, I think the old iPad software was not great about determining if your finger was touching or it was a pencil early on. Mm -hmm. So you would end up getting like stray marks in some apps. And so this is a way to yeah. um, stop that. But it's got the, the second benefit is keeping your hand from sticking to the screen. So how, and so have you tried, have you been using this magnetic um, screen cover and how does it work for you? No, I don't have you it yet. yet. It's on, okay. it's on my list, but I thought okay. it was really cool. Cause um, yeah. like I said, I never wanted to put a permanent screen yeah. protector on it. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting it this month, hopefully. Okay. I would say, um, you know, uh, paper like was a past sponsor of the show, but regardless of that, um, I like them because I think they, do the way they structure it is the little bumps that they're creating to create that paper like surface. They're sort of scientifically placing them. Mm -hmm. So I've been actually pretty surprised when I use my iPad that um, it doesn't seem to impact when the screen is playing like for TV. Mm -hmm. um, so you might be surprised how clear it actually is. Um, okay. So that might be worth like maybe try one out. Like it'd be really interesting for you to try both the magnetic and the paper like and see, compare them and see. I would, my concern about the magnetic one would be, if it's kind of floppy and there's air between there, like mm -hmm. how does that react? Maybe that's not an issue, but that would be my, that would be what I would wonder about. Maybe you can, you can share that in a sketch note for us or a video yeah. or something. I'll, I'll do that once I've tried it out, but it's also really cool. I've never had the chance to talk about 
like paper-like to anyone. Yeah. Um, so it's really cool that you didn't have the impression it ruined like your other iPad, like the other things you do in the iPad. <laughs> no, I was always all. afraid of that. And that's why I didn't want to buy it. But um, I might give it a go. All right. Maybe I'll reach out to my friends at Paperlike and say, here's a person who needs a sample. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're, I, I they're, would appreciate that. <laughs> they like they like doing that stuff. They're really great people at, at uh, Paperlike. It's a German-based company as well. So. Ah, I didn't know that. They're in Hamburg. Cool. So, you know, they could just cool. like run a little truck down and drop it off at your place. Really so. cool. <laughs> I'll, I'll write a review then. Okay, Definitely. there you go. We'll, <laughs> well, we'll work on that offline. Yeah. Okay. Well, simple tools. I like simple tools. I like buying my, my tools at the at the corner drugstore, right? So it keeps things okay, real cool. analog. So it makes it easy to replace things when you're in another country as well, right? You can yeah. probably find a gel pen someplace. So... Let's shift now. This is uh, this part where we talk about tips mm -hmm. and um, we like to frame it as someone's listening as a visual thinker, whatever that means to them. Maybe they feel like they've sort of reached a plateau or they're a little bit burned out or they need a little inspiration from you. What would be three things you would tell that person to kind of inspire them and get them moving forward again? So I would say the first thing is pick a project you're really excited about. Like I always also say... For me, I do a lot of visualization of, of podcasts, live talks, reports, anything like that. And I need to like be excited about the source material because I, I find, especially with freelancing, where you don't always kind of can influence what the topic is about or whatever, um, that really helps. Like I don't do anything, any work anymore where I'm like, oh, this is really uninteresting and I don't mm -hmm. want to be drawing this. And then also, if it's not, if you're not working off of source material, maybe like do the travel sketch notes, like if a lot are lumped, mm -hmm. you know, pick something, pick a passion project. I would say this is a, this was a huge learning curve for me that I only enjoy sketch noting when, you know, the topic is right and mm -hmm. what I draw about, like really aligns with my interests and with mm -hmm. my passions and then the next one it sounds so cliche mike but i think it's so important um don't compare yourself to others yeah definitely full stop like i i know there's like a comparison is the thief of joy or something and but mm -hmm. i think it's really true i have a really basic and minimalist style and when i look at your work or at nadine rossa's work i think she was mm -hmm. on your podcast yeah, yeah. or franziska schwarz i always get I'm like, oh my God, I have such a long way to go. And is my work even good enough? But the validation I got from the outside world tells me it it is good enough. You know, yeah. there are people who appreciate your minimalist style that's not super visually complex and doesn't have mm -hmm. all like the all the really sophisticated doodles and everything. Um, and I've come to accept that, I think. And also, like, I kind of try to stay in my line. I don't look at the work of others so much. Like, if I do that, I set a certain time frame where I look at your work and then I get some inspiration, but then I leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And maybe even, maybe I know it's harsh, but maybe that even means unfollowing a few people on mm -hmm. social media mm -hmm. and only looking at their profiles at, like, I don't know, once a month or something. Because mm -hmm. um, I think, or you learn basically to not compare yourself to others, but I think it yeah. takes some time to learn that. And then also, also sounds a bit cliche, but don't overcomplicate things. Don't mm -hmm. overcomplicate sketchnoting. I think that's also in your book. A sketchnote doesn't have to be visually complex. Um, and for me, that ex for example, that means if I don't want to draw people, I don't draw people because yeah. I don't, you know, I, I I don't, maybe I don't like the style of it or maybe I haven't put enough practice into it. Well, then I don't draw people. I don't have to do everything that the sketchnote community says that I need to do and how a sketchnote right. is supposed to look like, you know. Um, and then, yeah, because I have quite a minimalist style and I like it that way. And maybe at some point it gets more sophisticated or maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Um, yeah, I would say those are my three things. Oh, and mm. can I do a fourth one? Yes, you can. Don't overvalue talent. Like people always mm. on LinkedIn, they always tell me you're so talented and it gets me really angry because it's because <laughs> ske sketchnote thing is basically you put in the work and the practice and then you get better. It's like running or playing an instrument. Yeah. It has nothing to do with talent. Like if you look at my early drawings and when I started practicing with your book, it looked like, yeah, didn't look great. So um, yeah, don't, yeah, don't overvalue talent. There's no talent. You can, everybody can learn sketchnoting. That's, I would print this on a t-shirt. So yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's I love it. Four is great, and we love it when people give us extra ones. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, four is my lucky number. So there. Oh, you go. there we go. 
I think that's uh, isn't in Asia isn't four a lucky number? I'm not sure. Oh, I'm I don't sure. know. I was I was born on the fourth, so um, yeah, that's why. I, I think actually in in Japan, four is unlucky, oh. if I remember right. Because and I know this because I was an old Palm Pilot guy back in the day, uh, and okay. Palm did not release a Palm four because it was popular in Japan, and four is considered, I think, is related to death or something like that. So that's why they oh, jumped no. from the three to the five. Oh no! That's no, with us, it's a lucky number. That's yeah, a lucky number. I think so. We make our own luck, right? Yeah. So, Katrina, what is the best way for us to reach out to you? Obviously, LinkedIn would be good. Um, LinkedIn is any... great. Yeah. So it's basically Katrin Vitek on LinkedIn. I have this website that I created in university, but I don't maintain it so much. But that's <laughs> uh, Katrin-Christine.com, I think. Okay. And then also that's the same Instagram handle, uh, Katrin.Christine, I think. Um, I don't post so often, but maybe that might okay. change in the future. Okay. So that's basically the three channels where you can find me online. So primarily, it sounds like LinkedIn is the best place. It's obviously you're yeah. pretty active there. So that's if you want to see your work and connect there, that would be the place to go. So that's really great. Exactly. Well, this has been really wonderful. It's uh, time has flown by. It's been such yeah. a fun discussion with you and Thank you so much for the work you do and your attitude and how you share your work and are really an ambassador for sketchnoting in the LinkedIn world, uh, probably more than anyone that I can think of. I really appreciate that. And it's so good to see someone representing and having such a positive attitude uh, for the community. I think it's just, uh, you're just a great ambassador for us. Well, thank you for inventing sketch notes, Mike, and thank you for writing that book because otherwise I wouldn't be here and I definitely wouldn't be at that point in my career. I'm pretty sure about that. And it was an honor to be on your podcast. Thank you so much wow. for the invitation. I'm super proud um, of where I got uh, along the way and I'm going to share the podcast with all the people I know and also post it on LinkedIn so right. maybe a few people can see it. Well, for a, first, it. Pod for a first podcast in English... You did an excellent job. You're a really great uh, conversationalist. So thank you. Be, be very proud of that. You did a great job. And uh, maybe I'll send this to people as a guide <laughs> if they're on this the show to listen to listen this, to you. This means a lot. Thank you so <laughs> yeah, much. Yeah. Well, for everyone who's listening or watching, this is another episode of the Sketchnote Army podcast. Until next episode, we will talk to you soon. The Sketchnote Army podcast was created by me, Mike Rody, and brought to you by Road Design Studios. It's produced and edited by Alec Polianis of Amp Creative Studios. The theme music was created by John Schiedemeyer. To support the creation of this show, I invite you to buy one of my books, The Sketchnote Handbook or The Sketchnote Workbook. You can find the books on Amazon or go to peachpit.com and use the code RODY40 for 40% off. Please share this podcast with other visual thinking friends and be sure to leave a nice rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app so others can find the show.